Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, six uh, research seminar. I'm Simon Wakeling, a lecturer here in the school, uh, and I'm hosting the session on behalf of the school's uh, research committee. So thanks everyone for attending. It's great to see um, people from all over the university and perhaps beyond uh, here today. And on that note, if you could uh, just jot in the chat uh, who you are and where you're based and where your uh, school or what university you're from, that'd be really helpful for us to track uh, attendance at these uh, at these seminars. Um, uh, I'll begin by acknowledging the Wiradjuri, Gunnawal, Birupai and Gundagara peoples of Australia, who are the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which CSU's campuses are located, uh, and pay respect to their elders, both past and present. So it's our usual um, six research seminar format. Um, we'll have about a 40 to 45 minute presentation uh, and then plenty of time for questions uh, at the end. And feel free to put questions as we go in the, in the chat and I'll keep um, track of those and then um, put them to, to Hamid at the end. Or if there's anything pressing, uh, Hamid might spot them too and, and address them as we go. So today's seminar is titled Gender Disparity in Australian Science, a study of article authorship, uh, and our presenter is Dr. Hamid Jamali. Hamid's an associate professor here in the, the School of Information and Communication Studies, uh, received his PhD in Information Science from UCL University College London uh, in 2008. Uh, before joining CSU, how many years ago now, Hamid? Seven, eight? Uh... Like when I joined, I yeah, joined in 2016. Yeah. Okay, so six years ago, uh, he was an associate professor at uh, Karazmi University in Iran. Uh, and Hamid's research interests broadly cover the area of scholarly communication, including reading, citing, and publishing behavior, journal publishing, open access, and research evaluation. So that's definitely enough from me. Um, I'll pass over to you, Hamid, for uh, today's presentation. Thanks, Simon. Let me share this screen. You can see enough of me, I think, on the corner of the screen. So thanks everyone for joining me for this presentation. It's called Gender Disparity in Australian Science and the Case of Article Authorship. Uh, it's a piece of research I did with the collaborator Ali Reza Abbasi, University of New South Wales. Uh, uh, and uh, I thought I have a bit of data to present, but I thought it's uh, for me it was more about more an excuse to basically ask people to get together and uh, use it as an opportunity for discussion. I know a lot of, I know we have a circle of gender studies at CSU and, I, and people would be willing to share. I sh should say a few things before I go into the presentation. First, I, I would like to apologize for uh, the, the range of research I'm talking about today the approach to gender they take is not inclusive. So they usually have a binary view of gender. And that is not because peer researchers intentionally take that approach because the limitation in data and methodologies forces them to take that binary view of gender. So the, that's, I'm talking about the range of research that I've discussed today. And I also know that the same way when we talk about race, we shouldn't mean people of color. Basically, race means anybody from any race. Gender does not equal, equate women or female. Uh, but again, in a lot of this research, when they talk about gender studies and so on, they end up discussing only uh, one gender. Uh, and that, again, might be because of some of the limitations in methodology and so on. Uh, and that's the, again, because of the type of data I, I use, uh, the approach that uh, in my research that I will uh, present today uh, will take, which is a binary view of gender just because of the limitation in data. So uh, this is not a new issue. The, it's, it's been quite a few decades. People have been researching about gender and science. I think uh, Evelyn Fox Keller in 1978 uh, she was the one who introduced that term into literature 
And actually that first paper and piece of writing wasn't about female, it was about masculinity in science. Uh, but people also discussed women in science. Uh, pioneers uh, looked at the women, history of women contribution in science that they uh, mostly uh, had been ignored by science historians and so on. And also different perspective uh, they took uh, to this, uh, study that and uh, discuss them. I should also say that I am, my approach to, to this issue is from the scholarly communication perspective and because I'm interested in quantitative studies of scholarly communication and that includes article authorship and citations and research evaluation and so on. By no means I'm a, a I'm expert in sociology of science. I have, I, I believe that uh, there are uh, experts amongst us, including Donna and other people, they, they are better qualified to discuss about those aspects which are related to sociology of science. Uh, and my approach would be just about this scholarly communication. That's why I did this research. It's the second piece of research I've done in this area. Uh, the other one was uh, years ago when I was a PhD student. And th so the reason people, are, of course, are interested first is the equity because people, we believe that people have equal opportunities for participating in anything that they want and uh, have access to opportunity for progress and uh, career and development and so on. But also research has shown that diversity generally is good for innovation. So if you, um, whether it is research or a corporate environment or whether uh, any environment, demographic diversity is good for innovation. As I said, a few decades of research, especially in STEM, because the research after research has shown that uh, the area is uh, worse in STEM, and that is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in terms of the pre presentation of, representation of uh, uh, women in those areas, and also the rate of the um, progression in, in career that they might have. Most of the past studies have been based on uh, things like statistics from higher education, surveys, or qualitative studies that have, people have done to find out the reasons, but also to look at opinions, attitude, and perspective that people might have about, you know, in the in research and science and academic environment. And that is not just about how many women are working in research or science, but also about the, the masculine nature of science. So it's not about just increasing the number, but also fixing the culture that takes a masculine approach to science or the way they define the, the nature of women. And you've heard in the, from the news sometimes, I might have read in the literature phrases such as glass ceiling, gender filter, leaky pipeline, and all of those refer to underrepresentation, but also the uh, invisible barriers that the uh, uh, people from certain gender they might face in progressing in through their careers. So, and, and the data actually shows this, that the number of, for instance, I have a slide that shows that the number of women in Australian uh, academic environment is more than men, but when you go to higher level, it becomes the opposite. So you see a lot of male and fewer female. But the research I'm discussing started when there was a change in the type of data that was made available. In 2000s, uh, studies started to look at authorship, but most of those would pick, for instance, if, uh, one journal or a few journals from the field, like let's say surgery in medicine, and they would go through the names of author and then based on the first name, decide whether that person was a male or female, and then do a statistical analysis of, for instance, uh, gender representation in or article authorship. But they, most of them were small scales because they had to do manual data collection. In early 2010s, for instance, Web of Science in 2011, they started adding full names to the, to the database. So is before that, when you downloaded, for instance, did a search in the Scopus or Web of Science, you would get only the initials. For instance, it would say H Jamali, but after, uh, early 2010, they added the full name, whatever people put on the paper, they, you could see that full name in the, in the database as well. And people saw an opportunity that they could use the first name 
as a proxy to identify the gender of people and therefore do larger scales of study about uh, questions like these questions in terms of productivity, whether male and female are producing the name, same number of papers. In terms of citation impact, for instance, if one gender, gender has a citation advantage over the others. Or in terms of collaboration, whether women are more collaborative with men and men with men, or one of the gender is more egalitarian. And in terms of self-citation and research shows, for instance, the self-citation rate is higher among uh, male scholars. Or in terms of gender-based citation bias, whether people intentionally discriminate in their citation, but not, not citing, for instance, people from uh, the opposite gender or another gender, uh, to stop them from uh, getting promotion and so on. And also the type of contribution, for instance, the type of task that people do in collaborations and co-authorships. So they used all those uh, large data sets that were made available to answer questions related to these types of uh, issues in scholarly communication and uh, research. In the next few slides, I'm going to uh, basically review and this would be probably a, a, an interesting bit of the uh, presentation. What past studies show us about some of those questions, like in terms of publication count, a larger scale study of 36 million authors from uh, science, technology, engineering, uh, mathematics, and I think medicine for 15 years showed that despite progress, gender gap appears likely to persist for generations. And they did also progression into the future. And that's why they know that, for instance, it's not going to be fixed for another 20, 30, 40 years in some fields and in certain countries. And particularly, the issue is the not good in surgery, computer science, physics, and math. The gap is especially large in authorship positions associated with seniority. And also, prestigious journals have fewer women authors. The other interesting thing they found was that wealthy countries uh, such as Japan, Germany, and Switzerland had fewer uh, women authors than poorer ones. A study in India showed that uh, the ratio of female first authored papers to male first authored papers uh, was highest in biology, agriculture, and medical sciences, and lowest in engineering and information, information technology. And these are the type of thing that you see over and over in research. Basically, there are gaps, those gaps partly depend on the fields or discipline, and also there are country differences. In UK, a study showed that there was substantial variation in gender disparities for both fields, with over twice as many female first authored papers in veterinary, veterinary science and nursing, and over three times as many male first author papers in math and physics. Another large scale study, 30 million articles they analyzed from 31 countries for four years. They showed that almost half of the subjects were always more male, like math, and uh, some were always more female, like immunology and microbiology, than the national average. Uh, another study showed that disparity was worsened, at least in some fields, during COVID. So this was a recent paper. And that's probably makes sense to many of you because of the homeschooling and the caring duties and so on that, for instance, women uh, on average might have had more responsibilities and therefore they had to do more sacrifice. And the data showed that during that period, male produced more papers, for instance, than female colleagues because they had to do more sacrifice. Another paper, 8 million papers, they did the historical data, they looked at JSTOR, that is a database in UK that uh, archives all of the older articles from like a few decades ago up to like more recent times. And they, uh, really, they found out that men predominated in the prestigious first and last author positions, and women were significantly underrepresented as authors of single authored papers. So they were less likely to have papers just by themselves. A study in US, USA in the STEM showed that females have significantly fewer distinct co-authors over their careers. So they 
co collaborated with uh, fewer people. And also they found that, that they were uh, lower, less likely to repeat previous co-authors. So uh, working with the same people over and over. A larger scale study in mathematics showed that although there have been progress, for instance, the number tripled since 1970s, they still publish less than men at the beginning of their careers, and they have and they leave academia at higher rates, and they are less representative in top-ranked journals, and they publish less single author papers. So those are all about productivity in terms of who is writing more paper and so on. When we look at the collaboration in terms of who's, who is working with what and with, with who and in terms of co-authorship, a bigger study of the 270,000 scientists showed that men were more likely to collaborate with men, with men. Women were more egalitarian, which means they were more likely to work with men and women and people from different genders. Only exception was engineering, where the gender bias disappeared with the increasing number of collaborators. Uh, PLOS One is a big uh, open access mega journal. Some of you might be familiar with. When you write for PLOS One, you have to put a note at the bottom of your paper saying who did what, like first author did the conceptualization, the second paper author did the data analysis, the third one wrote the draft and so on and so forth. So one study, they looked at the old, those contribution notes in all of PLOS One papers from 2008 to, uh, up to 2012, and they found out that, again, there was differences in terms of gender, in terms of who actually did what. And they, uh, one of the findings was that women were significantly more likely to be associated with performing experiments, and men were more, men were more likely to be associated with all other authorship roles, such as conceptualization of research, writing the drafts, and supervision, and so on and so on. In terms of citation advantage, there is good evidence in research show that uh, the, the support citation advantage for female in many fields, which means although women are writing fewer papers, their papers seem to be of better quality perhaps, and they receive more citations than paper written by uh, male authors. And overall, female first author citation advantage they found Although in most broad fields, in certain years, uh, in certain countries, for some years it reversed. So it means that uh, men, male first author papers, uh, papers had citation advantage. International differences include medicine having a female first author citation advantage for all years in Australia, which means papers in Aust Australian papers written by uh, females, they attract more citations on average than papers written by. Uh, male authors in medicine in Australia. Another study, small female citation advantage they found uh, was the norm over time for all English speaking countries that included UK, Canada, USA, Australia, Ireland, and I believe uh, South Africa, except the USA where there has been no practical difference. And female citation advantage was the was largest and statistically significant in most years for Australia. Uh, people also have hypothesized and put forward theories to explain why are some of those gaps that we see in productivity, in citation, in the representation of women in science and so forth. So there are a couple of theories and hypotheses related uh, to constraints on female career choices. The first one uh, suggests that there are biological sex differences in abilities, and but there is no sufficient evidence. Although there might be marginal differences in some relatively minor abilities between male and female, they don't uh, explain the gaps that we see in representation of uh, women in science. The other theory was about, is about socialized gender differences in capabilities. So for instance, research shows that uh, in younger girls or early year at the school, uh, Boys and actually in, in science, for instance, girls outperform boys in science tests in most countries. And it, uh, the gap between outperforming uh, 
the girls do is actually larger in countries where you find larger gender inequality. Uh, or in USA, research showed that, for instance, girls and boys equally are capable of computing, younger girls and bo boys, but as they go to higher years in the higher school and so on, because of the social factors and so on, they, the girls drop uh, and they fall behind in terms of like those areas of computing. So those childhood social, social factor leading to gender capability differences in favor of boys for a STEM at least. Some studies suggest. The other one is gender conformity. If, if I identify as, as male, I'm more likely to pick a career that uh, people perceive to be a male career or male dominated career and behave the certain way that people perceive that those are, you know, things that associated with, with certain gender. Other reason in this other theory is about explicit discrimination. Still in many countries, you can see that promotion committees and recruitment panels are male dominated and there might be explicit discrimination, for instance, not hiring uh, certain gender because they have uh, they assume that you know they might not be as capable or for other reasons there are also implicit discriminations on average women have more uh, uh, responsibilities and panels and universities or policies might fail to account for those higher responsibilities for instance caring responsibilities that female uh, researchers have and therefore not accounting for those in promotions and you know grant uh, applications and so on. There are also a couple of theories in, uh, about that they high, high emphasize female choices. They say you know the for instance in, one is about biological sex differences in preferences. Research shows that girls and boys before actually they, before they child children before they before they learn about gender identities they have different preferences for toys. And people think that those, some of those preferences that might be linked to genetics later might uh, translate into different preferences for careers. The other one is socialized gender differences in career goals. And people think that they hypothesized uh, and some research actually tested those hypotheses. They support a little bit of, they explain a little bit of differences, but not all. One is that males are attracted to research, to, to do research about things, and females are, they, they prefer research that involve people. Or they say females choose a career for social, societal value, while males are more likely to value personal advancement opportunities. Uh, and people have tested a lot of these, and uh, of course, no definitive answer, but one thing is clear that apart from increasing you know, trying to change policies and so on to increase the number and representation in science, there is need for cultural transformation as because people say it's not just about the number, it's about the attitude and perceptions and behavior and so on. So that masculine culture that might be in academic environment. So that was a review of the past studies. I will have a few slides to share a few because this is a work in progress. We did a study, we looked at Australian art, uh, articles uh, where the first author was affiliated to an Australian institution. And we looked at the papers from 2010 to 2020, that was about 400,000 papers. And we wanted to compare the number of papers, citations, but all, and also co-authorship. So what we did, we went to a database called Dimensions, which is a bigger database compared to Web of Science and Scopus. We chose that because it's more inclusive, but also because it provides field of research, so FOR. And this is the first, first, first time people actually looked at the FOR code. Past research looked at disciplines, but those disciplines were based on the categorization of um, journals in Scopus and Web of Science. But Dimensions provide FOR codes at article level, and they wanted to see, to look at FOR fields to see if there are differences in terms of field of research. So we got 900,000 papers. We did some data cleaning by working with Excel, writing a bit, a bit of Python codes and so on. We moved the 
the document types we didn't want. We kept the only papers that had uh, the first author was Australian. Then we removed those that author information was incomplete, like the first name wasn't there, it was initial and so on. The final data we had was 500,000 plus papers. And then we use the method for gender identification, which is based on first name. So we got it. There is a corpus called uh, based on the USS census. They have made that data set publicly available, which has a name. For instance, it says Morgan, and then it says Morgan in, 19, in 1990 census in USA, there were 3,000 people named Morgan. And then it says 95% of them were male. So you could. You can use that data set to match against the fair names, first names in your database and decide whether that and assign a gender to people. And this is binary because US Census is, has that binary view of gender. And we identified gender for 75% of papers, 402,000. But to make sure that the, this method was relatively accurate, I picked a random sample of 1,000 plus of those 500,000 papers. Then I manually actually searched them one by one, looked at their website on the university website and tried to determine based on the picture and what pronouns they used in, 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 their, in, in their introduction and so on, determine the gender. And then I compared that with the automated method we used and the precision was good, 99.5% and recall, was also acceptable compared to the other person, which means the, for in the case of male authors, 77% 70, 70, of male authors uh, we were able to identify. But there are issues, of course, with this method. One is that, as I said, it has a binary view of gender. It doesn't account for all the, the spectrum of uh, gender. But also there are unisex names like Morgan, can be male, can be female. We excluded those. And there are the other issues like Kim can be a, somebody from USA, like a American person, but Kim also can be a first name from Korea. And therefore just relying on Kim could, be, could result in misidentification because you need to know the surname and the nationality. This is not my data. This is from the higher education statistics in Australia. I just wanted to show you that you see, this is all full-time and fractional full-time academic staff, all levels from 2017 to 2021. And you can see the percentage of female is higher than the percentage of male, 56% and here 58%. But if you drill down and limit the data to only those above senior lecture, you can see it, it is the opposite. So two thirds are male all years almost, and only one third uh, are female, which means that these people do not progress to higher level for, for any reason. This is our data. So you can see from 2000 to 2020, the percentage of female authors increased over years, still not equal. So from 41% in 2010, 2010 it increased to 48% to 20, in 2020. And so that, that's a good progress, but it's still not, not equal, not 50-50. Then we go into the field of research. You can see there are certain fields like education. This is a female to male ratio. So the, the number of female divided by the number of male as a percentage. So you can see fields like medical and health sciences, education, psychology, and cognitive sciences, creative arts, language, communication, and culture, where females, there are more female uh, first author uh, papers than males. So especially in education, that is very large. But there are also fields such as mathematics, physical sciences, engineering, technology, and economics, then you can see that the female ratio is very low. And they, they are male, those are male uh, dominated fields. Other fields are uh, not like a balanced distribution, but better than those red ones. We looked also at the citation impact. And uh, for that, we 
use the use the citation index called field citation ratio from dimensions. And so to, to explain this, basically, instead of comparing number of citation a paper receives, uh, we, this is a normalized citation index, it, which means it compares a paper with another paper from the same field of research from the same publication year. So it compares Apple with Apple if, you, Apple, if you like, rather than comparing citation of one paper with the citation from another paper that could be from another year and another discipline, which is not fair. And overall, you can see that for, except for 2010, for some reason, the female had a kind of citation advantage. For most years, you can see overall, there is a citation advantage for male, but this is all of the fields combined. If you go to individual fields of research, interestingly, you can see that in mass science, where actually female produced fewer papers, they are actually producing better papers if we, if we make that assumption that in citation impact means quality of the paper, or that people might argue against that, but uh, to say it properly, they attract more citations. So I don't know how to explain this. It might be because those women are really passionate because they kind of go against the odd. They go into a field that is male dominated. So they must be really passionate. They do very good work and they might write fewer papers, but they write better or more impactful papers. And you can see this in a few fields like math, you can see in chemical chemistry, you can see in technology. Again, all of these are fields that we saw they, they had more males than females. But in some other fields like computer science, we can see that uh, males have citation advantage. And I think this should be the last one. And then we have plenty of time for discussion and questions. This is about the number of papers the number of authors paper, per paper. So you can see that on average, the number of authors contributing to each paper, for those papers that the first author, where the first author was female, is higher. So those papers that the first author is female, on average, they have more co-authors. And this one shows you that the number of single authors papers by female researchers over the years has been increasing, which is a good thing, which uh, as we saw in some of the past studies, one of the criticism was that they, for instance, in math, they are less likely to have two authors in, to have the single author papers. But this has been improving a little, improving a little bit over the last decade. Some of the references, if you're interested in reading or going into, uh, you know, some of these papers have shared the data and some of them, have, yeah, at least one of them have a website where you can actually play with data and like a filter by country, filter by field of research and to see what uh, will happen in the future or when you expect that uh, inequality to go away and be fixed. I'm going to stop sharing now, and then we will have some discussion. Hopefully. Thanks, Hamid. Um, like Thanks. loads of food for thought there, isn't there? Um, there have been quite a few comments, some you know really sad yeah. stories about you know uh, experiences people have had in these in the, you know related to this. Does anyone have any direct questions for Hamid to kick us off? And then can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Do you think that because I mean, obviously, there's so many things about this data where there's you know exceptions and and questions and problems. I mean, it it sort of points to the fact that there's clearly a lot of different further research to do, not only in terms of refining this sort of data, but in asking how this sort of data ought to be collected. I'm wondering if those issues themselves are of, of interest to you um, in future research. So in like uh, 
when, when I was looking at higher education statistics in you in the in, in Australia, obviously in the past they they would say only male and female. But if you look at data now in one of the slides, they have a third category, and that is the data from 2017 up to now only available. That they say indetermined uh, in yeah indeterminate intersex unspecified, which is better than just having male and female. So when institutions collect the data, they obviously can do a better job because they can actually ask people how they identify themselves. But those type of research, those are large scale studies using data from databases that are based on computers, basically harvesting publication from publishers, those are the, I mean, their concern from the, from, for publishers and so on, they, that is not that uh, whether people say the gender or not. That's automated because we want to get a sense. Although, as I said, we know the limitation, we know it's a binary and not inclusive view. But publishers, I know from, if you want to talk about the scholarly communication, we know that publishers now take make measures to be inclusive. For instance, you see publishers allow name change after you have published your papers. Quite a few publishers have options and uh, on their website that you can get in touch and say, I published this paper two years ago for any reason and you don't have to give a reason. I changed my name and I wanna retrospectively go back and change the name on that paper. And they will let you know, let you do that. So I know that they, there are, measures taking place in, in the field, like publishers and so on, trying to be more inclusive, but they're not there yet, obviously, because there are issues yet. I've got a question. Thanks. That was a, an amazing presentation and really food Thanks, for Sarah. thought for me, because I could see that you were talking about the socio-cultural level, and I thought, wow, there's some big changes needed, but not ones that we can deal with at the moment, I don't think. But we could deal with it at the university level. And yeah, so I was just wondering what you think the main intervention should be. Should it be around encouraging women to write more or, should, or is it about caretaking? Women do too much caretaking in the teaching arena, how do we? So uh, obviously, I mean, a lot of things, a lot of progress has been made if you compare to the past, like in the policies now we have for promotion, etc. cetera, there is, a, there is a section where you can explain the opportunity and say, you know, I was, I was a mother, I had disabled child, or I was doing this and that, and therefore I didn't have the same opportunity as my other colleagues. And therefore you as a promotion panel, should take into account when you're making that judgment. So those, a lot of these are now in the policies, for instance, in promotion committee, in recruitment committee, policy says that you have a, you need to have a gender balance in the panel. So it can't be male, all male sitting around the table and discussing like an appointment for a recruitment for, for people who might be from other gender and the same. So those, an important step is like, looking at those policies and legislations and make sure there is enough institutionalized support and mechanisms to account for those differences and support where we need to support. But obviously that can't change the mindset. If, if in my mindset, I'm not looking at my female colleagues equally and I have a, you know, culturally uh, my view is wrong, then that is not going to be fixed by policies. At some point they might stop me, you know, and preventing me from doing something, but this is more should be about that cultural transformation because it's not just about the number. And I don't think people want 50-50 split in all disciplines. I don't think anybody says, you know, we should have 50% mathematics female mathematics and 50% and they should be equal in all disciplines because people might differ different things. I think the argument is that those are signs that there might be discriminations. There might not be equal opportunity for 
girls who wants to be mathematicians. And the culture in that discipline might be growing and so on. So those need cultural, uh, and that could probably, and need probably to start from schools and younger ages rather than fixing people who are like 50 years old, almost like me and so on. So and it's gonna take a, a lot of time, obviously. And um, what about the role of editors? Because look, I remember getting a paper published and the editor supporting me, whereas all the reviewers were men and they were all saying no to the paper, but the editor was saying yes, and it became a highly cited paper. So I thought it's important sometimes to go into those non-traditional realms to publish, but it's often made quite difficult. Yeah. There's a good body of research about peer review as well. I mean, some, and there are two different types of them, double blind peer review, and some people now argue for open, open peer review. Some of the people who support those double blind, they support it because they say it uh, reduces discrimination. If you don't know the author is from, you know, Asia or the, gen the gender of the author, you're less likely to discriminate against them. But on the other hand, in open, open peer review, if it is open, then you can't obviously quite do that. So if you, because you need to be transparent, you need to be, uh, put your name. Uh, but there, there is, there has been research and some evidence that might happen uh, like that type of discrimination in peer review. Uh, also, there has been research about grant uh, success and gender, whether for instance, they are more successful or not. So all of these areas, I think there, there has been studies, but in terms of addressing, you know, diversity in the scholarly communication is a, a, a common theme now, a hot topic. And we see people write it, about it regularly in, you know, in, in where we read. Uh, having editorial boards that are more diverse in terms of demographic, demographics and so on, those obviously help. Any other questions for Hamid? Yeah, Hamid, I want to ask a kind of related question, um, yeah. which Donna, I'm sure you and others will have thoughts about, which is, um, well, one's an observation just about citations, that I'm certainly conscious that in certain parts of the arts and humanities, there are senior academics who really encourage people to think hard about their citations related to gender. That's certainly been my experience. And I'm not sure if other scholars actually actively work on that, but um, I don't know if anyone's, if that's an area that your method can look at. I'm not quite sure how you would, but it but does seem quite citations. interesting. Yeah, just about whether people's active behavior to cite women, for example, um, you know, uh, yeah, what, what that might do. So one, um, yeah, sorry, go on. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, one study hypothesized that. They said maybe people are bi being biased in the citation to stop women from progressing. And uh, one of the study, I actually was one of the slides. I don't think they find, they found enough evidence. Uh, there, is a, there is a research that shows, that, for instance, male uh, researchers have a higher rate of self-citation. Not that uh, that is necessarily a bad thing because there might be factors. We have to contextualize it and there might be factors that explain that, for instance, they might have a longer career, a, a larger number of publications, and therefore they have more papers on the same topic to cite. But that, that is, on the surface, that is one thing that happens. That paper, I think, was by uh, Larry B.A. and colleagues. Uh, I can have a closer look at it and or maybe email it to you, Luis. But I think uh, from the top of my head, I don't think they found evidence that that is the case. But I know that there are also other studies that, uh, and it's, it's, it's a bit tricky to find out because if you really want to do it, you might also talk to people or look at the citation behavior. But it's, uh, yeah, it's tricky to do research. And based on just numbers, I don't think there is enough evidence to say that people are doing that yeah. kind of discrimination or bias in citations. Thank you. Tabin, I, yeah. Tabin, uh, yeah. 
Hi, um, it's Tabin. Nice Tabin, to meet you. Sorry. Thank you for the uh, presentation. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, I did want to kind of bring to the table a little bit because I I've had the personal experience that I've mentioned in the chat. But a while later, I was then having a conversation with an engineering person um, and they blatantly asked me, why are there no smart women in engineering? And my answer was, you know, what smart woman is going to accept the way that men treat women in engineering? And that was the case at the time. But one of the biggest factors I noticed is, is people in my cohort dropped out of those male dominated fields was a consistent theme of sexual assault. And not from, not from the power structures, but from their peers. And I think perhaps that needs to be an important part of the discussion. Yeah. What do you think? I, I agree. So those issues, like those theories, one of them was socialized gender differences in capability. Those, again, research shows that things are getting better. For instance, a few months ago, if you remember, there was this old range of programs on radio and television talking about women who want to go into professions that are male dominated, like electricians and constructions and so on. And because now more people, and this is also research in UK as well, more people actually do that, go into those fields, take the lead, and there are more role models like females who are electricians or carpenters and so on. It, it things have, has improved over the years, but it's still, do, I mean, still not quite fixed. So it's still those cultural barriers are there, but it's definitely better than like 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But it's still, that, that is a problem because uh, it's obviously very difficult that is, if you go to a discipline or a profession where it is dominated by another gender and they might have a you know, certain view of you and your abilities and capabilities. So it takes a lot of fighting and, and so on, which is not easy. Cliff, I think you've got a hand up there. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Hamid. That was really fascinating and uh, uh, really interesting to see the breakdown, especially in my discipline of business and marketing. So we've got a, a fair bit to do there. Uh, I was going to ask you, what is your feel around, you know, and I'm using the terms global north and global south very broadly, like the developed versus developing. Uh, are you seeing a difference in that kind of, is it the same across both? Are you seeing a difference between them? So uh, there are country differences, as you saw in the data, for instance, they found that richer countries actually are not doing necessarily better, like in, in the case of Japan, Germany, and Switzerland, you would have assumed that, you know, things are perfect there, but actually wasn't the case. And they found that uh, in con the gaps between our performing, that research about girls outperforming out boys in science tests, that outperforming, the, the gap was bigger in countries where gender equal inequality is bigger. Uh, but as they, as people, which means, younger, they are doing great and you're smarter and so on, uh, performing better, not smarter. But as they, for social factors and so on, as they go up for those social factors and you know the, the cultural issues and so on, they are stopped for, for the same thing that we see in the literature like glass ceilings and so on. So there are invisible barriers for them to pursue the, that career. Also, they are doing very well in the early ages at the school and so on. They can't progress and go into higher level. And we see that in the academic environment, as you saw, if you look at the total number, there are more females than males. But when you look at professors and associate professors, you see it's the opposite. The two thirds are male and a third are female. Because, and research has shown, for instance, in like fields like technology and, and so on, a lot of people leave. Uh, also, they have a very good. They might have a very good prospect in terms of the career, in terms of the salary, and so on. But and might be because of the cultural factors. So, country differences there are, and it doesn't mean that global south 
is worse in those aspects in, in compared to global north. Uh, of course, we, it, it depends partly on which part of the data we are looking at. For instance, if you look at the number of students at universities, you see in a lot of developing countries there are more girls than uh, boys. But when you look at the top of the pyramid in industry, in academics, and so on, you see that that hasn't been reflected. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I've got one more if I'm not taking up too much air time. Uh, I just want to ask about the argument about um, that diversity is like there's lots of I, I found this woman Kristen Interman who writes about the role of feminist standpoint in science and she's got lots of research and lots of evidence for the value in science to diverse teams like empirical value like res better results more grants etc cetera, etc cetera. um looking at your table I wonder if some of these professions just are not like I noticed information science is very high in lack of women in one of your stats I can't remember which so I'm wondering if maybe these arguments have been understood in some parts of the science community but not others less well like I'm, I guess I'm curious about what's happened to that evidence about diversity is has concrete benefits it's a no-brainer let's do it it, yeah. It's interesting that your results don't seem to sort of, yeah. So that diversity includes gender, but also like other demographic, because like if you have immigrants coming from a different country with different experiences, they bring different perspectives and yeah. those translate into the innovation. So that's well mm -hmm. evidence in, in, in terms of being good for innovation, but yeah. whether people make decisions, make evidence-based decisions, and behave based on those evidence, that's a different matter. Uh -huh. So there is no argument whether you know, diversity is good for innovation or not. The argument is that whether people are aware of that and whether they, the decisions they make is based on that uh, evidence or not. Uh, mm -hmm. So that might not happen. And it's not just, uh, you know, because people, you can't say that people intentionally want to ignore that or they want to do against that. I think those changes, especially in those fields when traditionally has they have been male dominated, takes time, and obviously it takes a lot of cultural changes because you know academics they have every discipline and every university and every department or a school they have their own internal culture as well, and that takes time to change. It needs a, you know education, policy changes, the narrative at the university, and a lot of that. Interesting. I suppose I'm intrigued that that body of evidence has had less impact in some areas than others. It's interesting. Thank you. Okay, we've just got a couple of minutes of the hour left. If any has anyone has any final questions or comments, otherwise we can thank Hamid and uh, and close the the seminar. We could ask about that um, cool way. Yes. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh yes. So, yes. Good, good. How do you do it? Come on, have it. So go yeah. click on share a screen. Then on the top you see it says basic advanced files. Right? You click on advanced and then you choose the first one, which says better PowerPoint. PowerPoint has virtual yeah. background. So that's the one. There is another cooler one <laughs> that I saw one person. I attended the presentation, the presentation, the person did that, which was really cool, but, but I, I couldn't figure out how he did it. And, and that was basically text would appear on the bottom of the screen and then something appeared on the your right and so on. So it was very dynamic. I, I don't know, maybe it was an app on the top of Zoom or something. But this one is basically one of those advanced sharing options. Very good. We'll all be deploying that in our next meetings and spreading the word. So thanks very much, Hamid. I'm Thank sure you. everyone agrees. So I can see from the comments is excellent work and really interesting and important.
stuff so thank you for that and thanks everyone for uh for joining us and i hope you'll join us at the next uh six research seminar thanks all have a good day bye, bye.